there we go. Okay, um, fantastic. So first off, uh, I just wanna thank you all for being here. I wanna thank Helen for this unique opportunity to be able to talk with all of you today. Um, as Dr. Van Esch already said, my name is Christine Kokri. I'm a director in our Neurology Clinical Development Group at Ionis Pharmaceuticals. And it is my great honor and privilege to be able to lead our team uh, in the development of a therapy for MECP2 duplication <coughs> syndrome. So today, I'm gonna be telling you a little bit more about our technology platform um, about what we're doing and what the past work has been to lead us to the point where we are today in developing a therapy for MDS, and then talk specifically uh, about the status of our natural history studies and the plans for the upcoming interventional trial. So Ionis is, is really a leader in RNAi technology. Um, we've developed four of these already into medicines. You can kind of see them here at the bottom. Um, we have lots of drugs in development, uh, as you can see, and you'll see more on the subsequent slides. But really our goal as a company is to create transformational therapies for patients who need them the most. And I think our pipeline well reflects this ambition and goal. So uh, within Ionis, we have three main divisions, uh, one of which focuses entirely on neurological disorders. As you can see here, these are all of our ongoing programs in development, and we have many other programs that are either in the research phase or they progress to preclinical testing. So of course, it was quite exciting for us to announce for the first time publicly earlier this month um, that we will be developing ION 440 for the treatment of MACP2 duplication syndrome with a study that'll start in 2024. Okay, so um, everybody's gonna come out of today being a genetic expert. <laughs> so you've heard um, a lot of great information from Davut about the genetics of this disease. You'll hear continuously how we keep going back to the genetics of this disease. And that's because, of course, it's quite important um, for how we determine how to best treat children with MDS. And so as we think about genetics, I kind of wanted to start at, at some of the basic building blocks. Um, and that's to first think about uh, DNA, which of course all genes are made up of DNA, but this DNA doesn't do much in our bodies, right? It codes information that needs to become something else in order to actually function in our bodies. And so the next step in that process is to become something called messenger RNA, mRNA. Now mRNA can function in our bodies and it has certain roles, but most of the mRNA actually gets translated into something called protein, okay? Um, and in MECP2, the gene and the protein have the same name. So the MECP2 gene codes and gets translated into the MECP2 protein. And it's that MECP2 protein that is quite important uh, for the different functions in our body. And this includes informing on the structure and function of our tissues and organs. Proteins are the main ways in which cells communicate with each other. Um, and all of these things are very important because we are gonna talk about how antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs work. So proteins are large, complex molecules. Um, they do play these critical roles in the body, and I think we've really already touched on what all those critical roles are. Um, so now we can talk, now that you've kind of seen what these different pieces are, let's talk about how ASOs work. So ASOs, or antisense oligonucleotides, are um, really, let's take a step back for a second, just talk about how they function, right? In general, ASOs function through many different mechanisms. And depending on that mechanism, depending on the target, we can do a lot of things with antisense oligonucleotides. So we can increase protein production, we can decrease protein production, we can even change the protein that's produced. So ION440 is designed to specifically bind to MECP2 and decrease protein production. And we have shown this in both cells as well as in preclinical animal models. So how does it work specifically? So here's the antisense oligo. It gets taken up by the cell shown here. It enters the cell and it 
binds to the MECP2 mRNA in the case of ion 440, or in the case of any of our drugs, it's a very specific binding. It then needs to do something else. It needs to recruit another protein. That means it just brings that protein in to where it is. And the specific one it recruits is RNase H1. This is an enzyme, and what its job is is to chop it up. So it cuts up um, this duplex uh, structure, um, and as a consequence, you see in this case, there's a reduction in that mRNA. Well, when we reduce mRNA, there's nothing left to make a protein product, if you remember from the previous slide. So as a consequence, in this case, we're reducing the overall amount of protein. Okay. So let's talk uh, a little bit about how we administer our antisense oligonucleotides. So I'm gonna focus just on our, our neurological conditions, and so this will be very relevant for the way in which ion 440 would be administered. So we really wanna make sure, whenever we're giving any drug for any treatment, that it's getting to where it needs to go, right? So we wanna make sure that our neurological ASOs are getting to the brain and the spinal cord, which is where we need them to act. Um, there's a barrier around the brain called the blood-brain barrier, which makes it very difficult for drugs to get into that space, okay? So what we do is we take advantage of the fact that we can access uh, the brain through the cerebral spinal fluid, which is the fluid that surrounds and protects the brain and the spinal cord. We do this through a very common procedure called a lumbar puncture. Um, colloquially, it's called a spinal tap. Um, and in this case, we can collect CSF, perform different types of functions. In fact, that's how it's normally used. So if there's any sort of suspected brain infection, you may have to go a, a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap to collect that fluid, and then you can look to see if there is in fact an infection. So again, this type of procedure is done very commonly um, to look at information that we can find out about the brain without actually having to look at the brain itself. So how does this actually work? Um, so during an LP, a needle is inserted into the lower back. Um, we'll often use some sort of a numbing drug um, so that you don't actually feel the insertion of the needle. And we put this between two vertebrae. So the vertebrae are the, the bones that make up our spine. Um, we focus on a very specific region, which if folks are interested, we can talk about what specific region that is. And then we can collect CSF um, from that needle and from that, uh, from that initial injection. And so we've already talked about what the CSF is and why do we need to collect it. Well, CSF is, of course, very important for looking at other types uh, of molecules. And we'll continue to talk about biomarkers today, um, and biomarkers are just proteins that we can use to understand more about the progression of a disease, uh, and in the case uh, of an, a clinical trial, we're administering drug, we can use that CSF to tell us that our drug is where we expect it to be, so we want to be able to identify our drug in that space, and it will give us a good indication of whether our drug is doing what we expect it to do. That's something we call target engagement, so is it getting where it needs to go, is it hitting the intended target, MECP2 in the case of ION 440, and then is it starting to do the things that we expect it to do? Um, now, the good news is, is that your body is replenishing your CSF all the time. So the amount that we take to do these assessments will be completely replenished in the matter of a few hours. And then, in the case of a clinical trial, after the CSF is collected, we can just use that same needle that is already in the correct space to then inject the study drug. Okay. Um, so we've talked a little bit uh, about the technology platform. We've talked a little bit about ION-440 specifically and how it's administered. We're going to take us kind of go in a different direction now and talk a little bit more about MECP2 and our programs in MECP2 duplication syndrome. Okay. So MECP2 is really quite complex. It's a very complex protein, um, and it controls probably thousands uh, of other genes, and it does this through a process of recruitment. So we've already talked a little bit about recruitment when we talked about how a ASOs work. They pull in RNase H, they recruit it. So that's how MECP2 uh, exerts most of its function, and that's what's diagrammed here. Here's MECP2. Um, in, the, in this left panel, it's recruiting these different proteins, and 
And why you're seeing these little red flags is because the recruitment in this scenario is actually stopping or reducing the amount of protein that's produced. So that's one of the kind of series of functions that MACP2 has. It's a repressor. It means it can stop or reduce the amount of protein that's produced. What's very interesting and unique about this protein is it has a converse function as well that's shown here on this right-hand side. So on the right-hand side, we're watching MACP2 recruit other proteins, and in this case, it's actually increasing the amount of expression of those proteins, and that's indicated here in these little green flags. So quite complex protein. It controls thousands of genes, but it controls them. So I like to think of MACP2 very simplistically as a conductor. It may not necessarily be playing the instruments, but it's really important for making sure the right instruments are playing at the right time with the right intensity and the right level of volume. Um, and through that, it exerts all of its functions. So, some other important things to know about MACP2. MACP2 is expressed ubiquitously. That just means throughout the entire body. Um, however, the highest expression is in the brain. Um, now, we have lots of different kinds of cells in our brain, but one of the most important ones is a neuron, and that's where some of the highest expression of MACP2 is. Um, now, neurons are critical for communicating information from the external environment, also from the internal environment, so from within your body. Uh, they tell organs what to do, and they process the experiences that we have. We call this synaptic plasticity, okay? So as the body gets new information, as we have new experiences, the neurons help process that information, and it actually makes them change a little bit um, as they get that new information. Um, and so we know that when neurons aren't formed correctly um, and when they don't have the ability to adapt to that new information, they lose a lot of their function. Um, this is an image of a neuron here. It has a very specific structure. And we know that MACP2 is not only important for that structure of that neuron, but it's also important for determining the amount of neurons. And so if you have too few neurons, if you have too many neurons, both of those can result in different types of diseases. And as you heard, from earlier today, this is a very fine balance because while too much MACP2 results in MACP2 duplication syndrome, too little MACP2, as we've heard a lot about today, results in Rett syndrome. So, our genetic lesson from my talk <laughs> will not be um, as, as in-depth in and as, in, as involved as Davout's, and so um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully complement each other. But each of the cells of our body has 22 autosomes and then one set of sex chromosomes. And if you're female, it's two X chromosomes. If you are male, it is an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. And MECP2 is located right down here, as you saw earlier, at the end, the very bottom of the X chromosome in XQ28. And so we've heard a lot about these different types of um, genetic changes that can happen. And so when we have combination uh, of, of genes, which occurs because we inherit you know, one, one set from uh, each parent, there's different types of processes that can happen. It's not a perfect process, unfortunately, that recombination that occurs. And so what you can end up with is duplication. Duplication means there's an extra copy of MECP2 on the X chromosome. Again, we're just focusing on MECP2, but as you saw earlier, there's a lot of genes that are potentially involved depending on the patient. Um, and we know that both uh, MECP2 and IRAC1 are almost always duplicated, if not always duplicated in these patients. But again, we're focused just here on MECP2. There can also be a triplication, in which case there are two extra copies of MECP2 on the X chromosome. And then you heard a bit more uh, about this possibility of translocation. And translocation means there is an extra copy of MECP2, but it's no longer in the X chromosome. It's actually moved to one of the other chromosomes. And actually, Davi, it was a great uh, reminder that not only can that be an autosome, but it can also be the other sex chromosome. So it is possible we have translocation to the Y chromosome uh, in males, um, but it can also be one of the other chromosomes you see here. And this is just a karyotype, so this is a, a cartoon image of a karyotype, just looking at the different structures and sizes of those different chromosomes. 
So when any of these things happen, we call it a genetic variant. That just means a genetic difference. And that difference has important clinical implications, particularly in MDS. And so I'm about to go through a fairly complex slide. You've already had a great primer from Dr. Pelevin earlier. Um, but really, there's a couple of take-home messages. So the take-home messages, if the rest of the genetic information is complex, is that clinical presentation can vary widely in MDS. We can see it just right here, right? So we all know this, that all of the children present with different clinical features, and that what you heard today, which was very exciting and really does advance the field tremendously, is that the variant structure um, tells us a lot about what is the potential for that individual, what is going to be the severity of the clinical presentation, which has a lot of important implications. There was a question raised over here for how we treat different individuals with different variant structures. Okay, so for MDS, uh, in males, it is 100% penetrant, which means that every male with any sort of increase in MACP2 is going to have a clinical presentation and is going to present with the disease in some way, shape, or form. So again, males, one X chromosome. This is not necessarily the X chromosome. This is an icon of a chromosome. Um, and so when we have a duplication, what we see clinically is this results in what we like to call moderate to severe presentation. And it really just depends on the individual. If we have an autosomal translocation, again, we're just looking at the movement. Here, MACP2 is shown in blue. I should have mentioned that. There's MACP2 in blue. Um, and if it moves to a different uh, autosome in this case, we can see that that clinical presentation worsens. You saw all the great data um, that Dr. Pelevin shared looking at very specific features of clinical presentation. And if you have a triplication event, again, that's where we see the most severe clinical presentation in these individuals. Now, if we talk about females, they express probably an even wider range of clinical presentation. And that's because females have two X chromosomes. Um, and during a normal process, during embryonic development, something very cool happens, which is called X inactivation. So X inactivation means many of the genes on one of the alleles of the chromosome are silenced. Um, and as a, as, as a consequence, not a complication, as a consequence, Duplication followed by what we call favorable X inactivation results in mild or undetectable clinical presentation. So I've tried to show it here, where you can see that this, um, this copy right here is kind of uh, fuzzed out a little bit. And you can see the two copies of MECP2 in blue there. It's actually quite interesting, because what we find when there is a genetic variant, not just in MDS, but in other diseases as well, the body sometimes tends to know that the, there is a variant allele and you will end up with this favorable X inactivation. Normally, we think of X inactivation as random. So the, whether the allele came from the maternal uh, side or the paternal side, uh, we find that you actually have fairly random. Um, but when there's a variant, sometimes you get skewed in a favorable situation. Now, in rare instances, what we've seen uh, in MDS is that there can be unfavorable X inactivation. And in this one, what we see is that the, uh, the chromosome that has the, um, the duplication is the one that stays expressed, and the chromosome that has the individual copy is the one that is silenced. And as a consequence of that, we see a pretty wide spectrum of disease from mild to severe, with really most being moderate, um, is how we would describe it. In addition, in females, we can see translocations. So in, when this happens, uh, what you can see is, of course, we have this extra copy of MECP2, just as we do in the males. Um, and then irrespective of X inactivation, we have excess MECP2 in all of the cells of the female's bodies. OK, so we are going to look at some data. <laughs> I know you've seen a lot of data. Um, uh, today, uh, but we're going to kind of go through this one uh, together um, so that we can we can really understand what the data are showing us. Um, and so what's really exciting for us is that we have some great models, uh, mouse models, of MACP2 duplication syndrome. And what we see is across several features that are consistent between the mice and humans, if we treat these animals with antisense oligonucleotides that target MACP2, we can see improvements. So we're going to look at kind of some specific areas where we see that improvement here. 
So this right here, this is called a heat map. It's a lot of information, okay? Um, and so the intensity of the color corresponds with the amount of a gene product that is being produced, okay? And that's really what you need to know here. We want colors to look the same. Um, colors looking the same means they have the same expression levels. And so if we focus here, uh, this is the panel with the normal mice. So these are just normal mice that do not have a duplication in MECP2. This is their genetic signature, okay? And we talked previously about the fact that MECP2 controls thousands of genes. So it's not going to be shocking that we're seeing a lot of different changes across each of these genes. So each little line, each little horizontal line, corresponds to a different gene or gene product. And so there's the normal mice in the middle. On the left-hand side is the MDS mice. So if you just compare the middle and the left-hand columns, you can see a lot of difference in color, right? Very, very big differences uh, in, in the expression of these different molecules. If we now look, this is eight weeks after initiation of treatment with an ASO that targets MECP2. The orange column, so this kind of side, right-hand side over here, um, we see a lot of improvement in the genetic signature that we call this. This is this heat map. We call it a genetic signature between the mice, the MDS mice treated with ASO compared compared to the MDS mice that were not treated with ASO. So this is looking at another feature. As we know and as we've talked about today, seizures and epilepsy are quite common in the MDS population. And so this is looking at a surrogate of seizure activity. And so what you can see here, there we go, those are normal mice. And in the normal mice, we don't see any sort of activity happening in the brain that isn't what we would expect. By contrast, in our disease mice, and those are just our MDS mouse model, we see a lot of activity. You can see it's just these black lines, up and down black lines. We call those spikes. Um, and they're representative of clinical seizures. So they might be subclinical. Some of them might correspond to seizures. And four weeks after we treat these mice with an ASO that targets MECP2, you can see all of those little black lines, all of that activity almost completely gone. We're then looking at elements of neurodevelopment. So these are, these are looking a little bit more at exploratory behavior, socialization, as well as motor skills. This is a lot of dots. Each of those little circles represents an individual mouse. And as you heard from Davout, our mouse are all very genetically identical. And so we see you know, nice separation. But I'm going to have you focus on the far left and the far right. So the far left is our normal mice, and the far right are our MDS mice that have been treated with a, an ASO that targets MECP2. And what you can see is they look very similar. So we're seeing improvements in the different domains related to motor skills, exploratory behavior, and even socialization. And so to us, this is all published data. We've provided the publication at the bottom. Um, and th so this was very exciting for us. And it really is the data that helped drive the decision that continuing to develop a therapy, uh, an ASO that would target MECP2, did seem like a viable strategy and it warranted further investigation. But we do want to say that it is unknown whether an ASO targeting MECP2 in humans will work in the same way as that we observe in animal models. And so that's why clinical trials are so important and are necessary. So this is the path um, that we have been on um, that really has gotten us to the point that we are today. And that's thinking about our very initial collaboration uh, with uh, Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and so right here you can see 2013 is when Iona started collaborating uh, with Dr. Huda Zogby at the Baylor College of Medicine to think about developing an antisense oligonucleotide that would target MACP2. Uh, since that time, we have screened thousands of ASOs to identify a human candidate lead. Um, and we've taken those lead candidates and we've tested them in animals. So these are safety tests in animals. They're required by any regulatory body to be able to start testing a drug in humans. 
And in parallel to that, we've been doing a lot of work on something called a biomarker. So again, when we talked about proteins, I mentioned our strong interest in biomarkers. And so biomarkers are often proteins. They may be other types of soluble molecules that we can find in different matrices. So matrices just bodily fluids. Um, and in this case, we're highlighting blood and CSF, but we can also look in urine, we can look in saliva. So any sort of bodily fluid can often tell us good information about the disease state, and it may give us good indicators, of course, that in a therapeutic intervention trial where we're hoping to see improvement, we may actually see changes in those biomarkers before we see changes in the clinic and at home. And so that's why it's so critical that we identify them. It's also very important, as I highlighted here, I highlighted this one specifically, we need to be able to look at a reduction in MACP2. And that's very important because, and I, I did like the slide very much that Dr. Pelevin showed, which was kind of what is that therapeutic window, right? What is the range that we need to keep MECP2 in to make sure we're seeing improvement in the symptoms associated with MECP2 duplication syndrome, but we're not starting to see symptoms that are similar to Rett syndrome. And so it is a, a window, and during the course of the clinical trials will be part of our goal to identify what that therapeutic window is. Um, but this is really critical that by looking at the target itself um, or something that is related to that target, it will be able to tell us if we've hit the target enough, and it'll make sure to tell us that we haven't hit the target too much, the target, of course, being MACP2. So we've been working um, independently and also in collaboration with Baylor College of Medicine to identify these different targets. Um, and we've also thought about it from the standpoint of looking at other types of biomarkers. So we normally think of biomarkers as being fluid-based, but that's not the only kind of biomarker you can generate. Um, and so we've been working with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, and doing a little bit of work also with Baylor College of Medicine to look at electrophysiological measures. So big word, uh, but electrophysiology here is a non-invasive technique where we can look at signals that are in the brain that reach the scalp. And so the individual has to wear this little cap shown here, uh, and the cap can record and amplify those signals so that we can actually look at them. And this is looking, our brains are firing all the time, so there's lots of activity going on in our brains, but this is to also really look at aberrant or abnormal activity that we might pick up in the brain. And we know that that is something that we see in the MDS patient population population, um, and that also response to different types of stimuli can further enhance that. So response to light and response to auditory stimuli can further enhance differences that we might expect to see in an MDS patient compared to a child without MDS, and then also in an MDS child who might receive an intervention at some point. All of this is of course leading for, uh, towards our first plan interventional study, which as we mentioned is intended to start in 2024. Okay, so before I talk about the interventional trial, I'd like to first give an update on where we're at with our natural history studies. So a natural history study is designed to look at the course of the disease over time, and the individuals who participate in that are not given intervention or therapy, but they do continue to receive their standard of care. Um, and so that's what we're looking to achieve, is longitudinal, that means uh, information over time, in how these patients um, uh, their disease progresses. And so this study has two parts to it. Uh, we're looking at a medical chart review, so that tells us a lot of information uh, about how the child's disease has progressed. And then we're also looking uh, at biological markers, biomarkers, um, and disease progression in patients who do not receive any sort of therapy. Now this study, which is being conducted in the U.S., is a two-year-long study. The first year is quarterly visits, and then the second year is semi-annual visits. And so in addition to the information that we're getting from the medical chart review and in the information we're getting from the matrix that we will collect during the course of the study, we're also looking to validate clinical outcomes. Uh, and so we're looking at assessments that would be potentially used in a clinical trial that will ultimately be able to tell us whether ION-440 is efficacious, which means it treats the signs and symptoms of MDS. 
else. And you heard a little bit from Dr. Santosh about the importance in capturing that data about actually using metrics that may be used in a clinical trial. So it's a little bit different than just looking at the patients and the physician's notes, but there are scales that are developed that we use that have normalized data associated with them that may have been used in other types of patient populations with similar disease that, again, is going to help us understand whether or not we're ap appropriately treating the signs and symptoms of the disease. And so you can see what I've highlighted here is a lot of different domain, domains. Domains are just different types of features of the disease. So whether your child has gastrointestinal symptoms, whether epilepsy is a part of their disease at this point, uh, neurodevelopment is pretty universally observed um, as in this disease. All of that is going to be captured across those different metrics. And what's really important is some of those are going to be captured by the physician. Some of that information is going to be captured by you, the caregiver. We really value the fact that you see your child every day. You know how they perform. You know how they perform on a good day and how they perform on a bad day. And so a lot of these outcome measures that we're evaluating in the natural history study, and this will extend to the interventional study, are called caregiver reported outcome measures. And that gives you an opportunity to have your voice as part of the clinical trial process and make sure we capture the data that you see on a daily basis in addition to the great data that will be obtained by a study physician. So again, um, we have approximately seven sites in the United States that will participate in the study. Our goal is to enroll approximately 40 participants. Um, we have two sites active, and I'm very excited to share with you, and this is I'm almost a standing ovation to Dr. Pelevin. We have one participant who is enrolled in the study. So a huge congratulations to Dr. Pelevin and his site, who were the first to enroll a participant. We have many other participants who are in different phases of screening. And so we hope to have all of our sites activated by the end of this year. And our target is to enroll 40 participants over the course of about 11 months. In addition to that natural history study, of course, that gives us data, very critical data, but only on 40 participants. And so uh, as an organization and as a community, we need to continue to think about how to get more information. If you look at the literature, you've heard a lot about literature today. Dr. Pelevin and Dr. Santosh have kind of shared that information with you. And that's the information that scientists, clinical scientists like myself and researchers, clinical researchers, use to understand more about a disease and to potentially start to think about therapies. We need to publish the data, the information that exists. If you look in that body of literature, you can just go to Google uh, and look at the body of literature, the amount of papers, information on a disease like Rett syndrome is so much more substantial than what we know about MACP2 duplication syndrome. Now, we've known about the disease for a lot less amount of time, and so that's contributing to it, but it's really important that we can continue to add to that body of evidence so that we can demonstrate that we really understand this disease and therefore or we really understand what a treatment might look like in this disease. So we've added another type of natural history study to what we're trying to look at. And this is uh, through a collaboration we have with a company called Invite. So Invite recently acquired an AI platform called Citizen. And what they can do with this is they can actually curate and pull all records for patients from any doctor they've ever seen in any institution they've ever been to, and then use a tool to actually grab key pieces of information and consolidate it for us. Um, so this is really unique, and what it's going to let us do is it's going to let us capture the diversity of the MDS po population, so a broader patient population than we'll be able to cap capture in our ongoing natural history study and in our upcoming interventional trial. And and it'll really help us understand the course of the disease, the trajectory of the disease, and, and characterize the symptomology a little bit better. Um, and it'll complement our ongoing uh, study. And so it's a little bit different because it's completely virtual. Um, so there are no study visits required. There's an online um, setup uh, application. Uh, you, nobody at any of the uh, study sites has to fill out the information. It's all electronic, so it's captured electronically. And I, I've already mentioned the fact that we can capture all of the data um, from, from any, any place that a patient has ever seen. I see that there's a question. Yes. So, if it's virtual, why can't it be done worldwide? Because there's a lot of information in Europe and in other 
Yes. So that's a great question. So yes, so right now it's only being offered in the US because of the way that the information is captured and collected. So in the US we have a law called HIPAA and that HIPAA law gives you the rights to access all of your medical information in an electronic format. This is really key um, because we that's the way in which the AI tool can look at the data is it, it, it being in an electronic format. So even if your doctor prior to, I mean now almost Every, uh, every medical record is done electronically. You very rarely have the doctor writing notes on a piece of paper. They're putting it all into an electronic system. But that, that was really fairly recent. I mean, you know, even 10 years ago, five years ago, most physicians were still doing hand notes. It may make it into an electronic format or not. But this law in the US requires even those medical information that's in a paper format um, is captured and scanned so that we can make sure it's electronic. The other thing is is that Citizen and, and Invite is less of a new company, but Citizen is, is a new company, and the AI tool can look at English right now. So the AI tool can capture words that are written in English. And so the goal uh, is to be able to extend this, likely first to other English-speaking countries, and then subsequently the, the goal would be to consider whether or not it's possible to create the AI learning tool that can look at other languages to capture the same type of information. So those are the limitations and the goals for expansion. And, and Citizen um, w agreed, and Vite agreed that I could share that information with you. The goal to extend uh, initially to other English-speaking countries. And in fact, we're, we're doing a pilot right now. We're trying to start a pilot in Australia. Um, but again, it will expand to other countries uh, as well as it becomes feasible. So I have similar information here related to the numbers. This is a virtual study, so there are zero study centers. Our goal is to get at least 50 participants. We have had an overwhelming outpouring. This is in large thanks to our patient advocacy groups and the collaboration that we have with them. Um, in a matter of a few weeks, we had 31 participants enrolled and an additional 38 participants that are in different phases of enrollment. So this is incredibly exciting. Hopefully this means that we will exceed our expectations for how many are enrolled and of course you know for folks who will eventually listen to this presentation in the states we invite you to please continue to enroll in this uh, the information we get from it will be invaluable okay um, so lastly, we're going to talk uh, about an interventional trial, right? So, and I know there's going to be a lot of questions as a follow-up to this. So what will an interventional trial look like? So right now, our vision is this is going to be a phase one through two uh, study that's going to focus largely on looking at the safety and tolerability of ION-440, okay? And then as we can, we'll be looking at clinical changes. We've identified key exploratory outcome measures, efficacy outcome measures, that we believe will help guide us for our future developmental purposes. But the goal of the study is not to demonstrate efficacy. And so what that means is that a second study will likely be required to demonstrate efficacy. And part of the reason you know, why we can't do this at this phase is that, again, it goes back to the natural history uh, of this disease and also the availability of information in terms of how patients perform on the types of outcome measures that we can use in clinical trials. So that will be the focus uh, of the study. Um, this will be in a small number of participants. So again, we have not demonstrated that IN440 is safe and efficacious, and so it remains important um, to look at it in a small population um, so that we can assess if that is the case before expanding to a larger population. We will be doing this at several clinical sites around the world, um, and we will be looking at multiple doses. So this is very timely. A question was raised earlier about how are you going to deal with those different variants? How are you going to deal with patients who maybe have more than two uh, times the amount of MECP2? Um, and again, this is because we, we will be doing that. We will be looking at different types of variant structures, and we will be doing multiple doses to really determine what's the best dose or doses to take forward into future trials, and ultimately, if IN440 is demonstrated to be safe and efficacious, into a product that becomes available. 
So you will have to come into the clinic. So this is a, a trial that does require visits to the clinic. Um, and of course, at those visits, um, there, there will be study drug administered. Um, but one of the big areas, and we talked a bit about this, is that you'll have to complete tests, or the individual with MDS will have to complete tests that look at motor skills and communication skills, cognitive skills, as well, uh, I've, I've already mentioned communication skills, so there we go. Um, so that will be the focus of the types of measures that will have to occur during these clinic visits. Most of those measures will be performed by a physician or one of the other site's staff. But as I mentioned, we also need you as the caregivers to fill out questionnaires about how the patient functions and also your impression of how they might feel. Um, the other thing that's important to us is we're going to ask you to fill out questionnaires about how you feel and how you are functioning and what your life is like treating an individual with MDS. And those are important outcome measures for us to look at. And of course, I need to state this, I think this is very important, is that the evaluation of safety and efficacy of an investigational drug like ION-440 in a clinical trial is essential to establishing whether the investigational compound can help people with MDS. And as such, we are only offering the investigational compound as part of a clinical trial. So, so lastly, we wanted to share this. Um, we feel like it's very important for you to have resources and to know where additional resources can be found. Um, and so this is information related to where uh, the content for future interventional trials will be. We will be listing trial information on clinicaltrials.gov. In different countries, they also require us to share information about the trial design and the outcomes of the trial on a relevant local uh, website, and we will be uh, certainly uh, adhering to that. Um, in addition, we encourage you um, to take the time to get to know your local advocacy group, or if you don't have one in your country, to think about other countries that are nearby that might have advocacy groups that can support you um, on your journey in terms of both helping as you have a diagnosis and then thinking about future interventional therapies. Um, we also ask you to, to think about speaking to your physician about whether a clinical trial is right for you and your family. Clinical trials are a lot of work. They are very time consuming. And so so it might be the right thing for your family, and it may not be the right thing. Um, and so we also have resources. So if you're interested in more information about IONIS, our technology platform, or the information we can share about the trial, we've provided some emails here, as well as our website. Um, lastly, of course, we have uh, the referenced papers um, below there. Uh, the, if you're interested uh, in hear, kind of reading more about some of that data that, that I shared with you. Um, and so. We just want to end uh, with this, and then, of course, I'll take any questions, which is that we are incredibly grateful to any family who want to participate in any aspect of research, and whether that's related to the natural history work or whether that's related to clinical trials, we would not be able to progress any of our programs without your help and support. And so um, from all of us at IONIS, and particularly the dedicated MECP2 ION440 team, I want to thank you for all that you do for being here today, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, do we know <laughs> the duration of the clinical trials yet? Do we know the duration of the clinical trials? So um, the, the first clinical trial, the current design, has not been approved by any regulatory authority. Um, and so we have proposed a design to the FDA. Um, and we will be proposing that same design to other regulatory authorities in the countries that we go to. And once we have that approval, we'll be able to share the duration of the clinical trial and the planned intervals of dosing. So the question is, do we have an idea of what countries we will be going to outside of the US? So yes. Um, right now, we are performing feasibility. Uh, if you have more questions about feasibility, my colleague, Mandy Yarborough, is over there uh, waving her hand. And so right now, uh, in addition to the US, uh, for this first study, which has no bearing on what countries we will go to in subsequent studies, um, but we are focusing on the UK, Australia, Canada, uh, France and Spain. <laughs> Thank you for mouthing them to me. <laughs> so.
Lisa. Are you open to other sites? Uh, sure, yes, yeah. so the question is, are we open to other sites? So um, if your country has a uh, site, a center of excellence, uh, I would encourage you to email myself or talk to Mandy. Uh, it may be one that we can accommodate in this trial. It may not be one that we can accommodate into this trial, but I think it's important to highlight as well that IONIS will pay for travel. So there are, of course, certain stipulations related to participating in a clinical trial in a country that you don't live in, but it is feasible. And so I would say, you know, feel free to come talk to myself or Mandy about what that might look like if you are a family who lives in a country that I didn't just mention in that list, and we'll identify, you know, what sort of that path might look like for you. So, like, I wanted to clarify one thing. As uh, Kristen mentioned, uh, these clinical trials are very intense. We did a biomarker study during COVID time, okay? So, first, this kid is traveling. It's a rare disease. Everyone, almost everyone will travel to sites, right? It's, and you have to fly mostly. Even driving seven hours is too long. And these kids are very gentle. So... I was very brave when we were doing the biomarker study. Now I am trying to tell families that, are you sure that he needs to participate? Because it's gonna be a lot of time of yours. For example, we started the natural history study in Houston. A family lives in literally two, three hours by flight, comes, stays a week to, because to, to merge the visit one and two. And before that, comes a week later again, okay? I am relatively healthy and I'm healthy, right? Traveling three hours is a too exhausting thing, okay? So don't, like, never think that, oh, this is like we have to participate. Don't think it that way. But also selection of the patients. We need to select the safest to travel and also e ease on the parents. These are all out of considerations beyond the genetic structures or other things we are thinking. So it's a very complicated process. Hello? Yes. Oh, OK. And in terms of the approvals, like I'm sure they're different in every different country in the world, but say I'm interested in Spain, obviously, if you put in an approval to Spain, how long could that take before it's approved? Um, so we're, t we're talking about an approval to start the clinical trial or an approval yeah. of the drug? Um, okay, approval to start a uh, clinical trial. So uh, again, yeah, there are multiple levels. So not only do you have to get approved um, by the regulatory or competent authority, you also have to be approved by ethics. So in some countries, that's a country level ethics and a local level ethics. In other countries, it's just local, et cetera. So there are multiple steps. Um, you know, and so one thing I, I didn't say it was in my notes, but I didn't look at my notes. Um, was, you know, we appreciate your pay. We appreciate your patience because many of the timelines are in our control and many of the timelines are not in our control. So um, we can look specifically once we submit to MA, uh, not MHRA, um, the EU CTR. So Europe now does uh, a new process. It's an EU CTR, which goes to all European countries that will be involved. Uh, UK is no longer part of Europe. So uh, we submit separately to MHRA. So we can look specifically at those timelines from submission, but also recognize the regulatory submission is just one piece of the puzzle to be able to start the clinical trial in a country. So we can talk more about that and look at the timelines for individual countries if, if folks are interested. But in terms of feeling like, maybe not in Isaac's case, but that we're running out of time in two years, in five years, in 10 years? Oh, um, so our, our goal, Mandy, are we commenting on when we believe all of our sites will be up and running in 2024? depending on the regulatory body. Oh, sorry. Can everybody hear me? Thanks, Mandy. Sorry, put you on the spot there. So we are um, ideally hoping to get all sites up in 2024. Some countries might bleed into 25. Brilliant. OK. No, that's perfect. <laughs> OK, thank you. He's coming. He's coming. 
Hi, um, that was a really interesting presentation. Thank you so much. And um, my question is, obviously, you probably can't speak to the age groups that you're thinking about. Not yet. Um, but are you planning to, perhaps I missed this, are you planning to stratify patients in terms of the subgroups, or are you going to try and uh, include patients all across the spectrum of... So um, the approach that we're taking right now is to ultimately include patients across the full spectrum, but we believe in uh, very much in a risk-based approach uh, of drug development. And so there is likely that we will start with certain of the variant structures. Um, and then as we gain more information, we will expand to other types of variant structures. So, you know, the design of the first part of the study and then the subsequent designs, it, it maybe modulable. Um, and again, too, this is also based off of uh, a feedback we have um, from regulatory authorities in terms of how they would like us to consider the approach uh, of a treatment for MACP2 duplication syndrome. So this is with informed information. Mm -hmm. So the first study is looking at the efficacy and safety of it. And you mentioned sort of a follow on. Do you have to go through the same process again with the same timelines to get to potentially a therapeutic intervention or study? Okay, so yes, so the first the first study is the focus is safety with a component um, uh, of efficacy. The study is not powered to demonstrate efficacy. So in terms of, in, in, let me speak to the U.S. So in terms of the U.S., the way we can start a study is to open up an investigational new drug application. And that has all of the data that we've generated up to this point that supports starting a clinical trial. So that is a very lengthy process, right? So you saw on the timelines, very lengthy process. But now that body of, of information exists at the FDA. So now we're just adding to that. So no, timelines are not like this when we think about going from one trial to the next trial. We simply have have to provide the new information, the clinical information and non-clinical information that we have generated um, and provide that. Every regulatory authority, every ethics will already have all of the data, which is a huge amount of data um, that was generated prior to the point of the first clinical trial. So we're just adding, you know, a little bit more information that they will have to evaluate. Thank you. And just following on from uh, Ollie's question now, will the participation in uh, the initial trial then prohibit moving on to participate in future trials, or is it so once you've been once you've been in one, can you no longer do another? So that, so that's a great question. So. Um, I can't speak to specific details around trial design or duration of the trial at this point. However, um, our target right now is that our trials will have a seamless transition to long-term extension. So yes, you cannot participate in a second trial if you participated in the first trial, but if you participated in the first trial, um, you will transition to a long-term extension, which means that you will continue to receive drug until uh, the study ends or uh, we have commercial availability of drug. Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, is there a time limit as to when the interventions can be administered in theory? So for example... So, so at age, are we talking about a, a child's age? Yes, yeah, so for example, yeah. mentioned uh, oh, repairing, say, or the repair action to neurons but if a child is now adult, would that intervention still have any impact? So, so here's what we've seen in animal models. So in animal models, whether we administer an ASO that targets MACP2 at the very early stages of the disease, so in a mouse that's you know seven to eight, six to eight weeks of age, or we administer the drug to a mouse that's 35 weeks of age, so that's a full adult, right? That's a nearly one-year-old mouse, um, we see benefit. Right? So we see benefit irrespective of that. We don't classically think of MDS as a neurodegenerative disorder at the duplication. So you, I, I'm getting some agreement from Dr. Pelavin. So we don't think of it as neurodegenerative. And so neurons continue to remain plastic. And so we do believe um, that we will demonstrate benefit if the therapy is beneficial. Um, we would see it across the age spectrum. It may be differential. So you know, we want to consider 
expectations in terms of you know what a child who starts receiving it at a very young age versus an adult who starts receiving it may achieve. Um, but in animal models, we have seen improvement even in very old animals. Mm -hmm. So I'm here all day. Mandy is here all day. I want to make be cognizant that we are behind on our schedule. I did that at uh, Houston last year. Sorry, David. So um, we are here to answer any questions you might have, or you can reach out to the emails that you saw here. Um, if you'd prefer to communicate via email, we're happy to answer any questions that we're able to. So thanks again.